Hello everyone. Today we'll be talking about Fluteric Aciduria Type 1. Fluteric Aciduria Type 1 is caused by an autosomal re recessive mutation in the gene GCDH on chromosome 19. GCDH stands for riboflavin dependent luteral CoA dehydrogenase. And this enzyme functions to convert gluteral CoA into carotenyl CoA. Gluteral CoA is a derivative of the amino acids lysine, tryptophan, and hydroxylysine. We can see those three amino acids here. GCDH is a mitochondrial enzyme, like I mentioned, um, and is expressed almost exclusively in neurons which causes some of the downstream effects that we'll talk about. As a little memory device, glutero-CoA is derived from lysine and tryptophan. Lysine and tryptophan start with L and T respectively, and there's an L and T in glutero, so that can help you remember that. To give you a sense for what this pathway is important in, Crotonyl-CoA goes on to be converted to HMG-CoA, um, which is a substance that uh, is inhibited by statins, uh, which inhibit HMG-CoA reductase. And that's an enzyme that goes on to help produce uh, some derivatives that are really important for cholesterol synthesis, uh, vitamin K synthesis, as well as the synthesis of all uh, steroid hormones in the body. So when we have an absence of GCDH, as shown here, what we get is a buildup of glutaryl CoA, which then reacts with a variety of substrates um, to generate the metabolites that we see in the blood and the urine. So primarily, glutaryl CoA is um, converted to glutaric acid. It can also react with carnitine in the body to form glutaryl carnitine. We'll come back to that in a later slide. Uh, other metabolites that can be seen in the urine are glutaconic acid and 3-hydroxyglutaric acid. This is where the name glutaric aciduria comes from. We can see the word glutaric acid in the name of the disease, and urea refers to the urine, which is where we see a lot of these metabolites. So this disease is rare, presenting in about one of every 90,000 newborns. It can be detected on newborn screening, um, which has a pretty high sensitivity for detecting this disease. What we'd expect to see um, is a, um, an infant, not necessarily a newborn. Um, in fact, this disease rarely presents in newborns, and this is in contrast to other organic acidemias, which usually present in the first week or two of life. Um, however, the, the patients usually present in the first one to two years of life. Um, the classic presentation is a patient who has a fever, generally in the, se in the setting of an infection, and this precipitates a metabolic decompensation resulting in ketoacidosis, hyperammonemia, hypoglycemia, and encephalopathy. Some of the complications of this disease are primarily neurologic. Um, this can result in a metabolic stroke, which classically leads to infarction of the globus pallidus, which is the movement center of the brain. This can cause uh, movement disorders um, in patients. Uh, one other thing that we can see are subdural hemorrhages. Um, this is classically seen in our patients as well and can actually be confused with non-accidental trauma. Um, sometimes we can also see bitemporal hypoplasia as well. So there's a little memory device here to help you. Um, globus pallidus, the GL in globus, um, is similar to the GL in gluteric to help you me remember that. Um, patients can also present with an enlarging or a large head circumference and also developmental delay for similar reasons. So the diagnosis is made um, 
initially using some standard labs. So on a BMP in an acutely ill patient, we'd expect to see an anion gap, metabolic acidosis. And that's because we have anions, which are glutaric acid present um, in the blood. We may or may not see an elevated ammonia level, um, which as we know, elevated ammonia can be uh, typically associated with urea cycle disorders. Uh, however, the distinguishing factor of organic acidemias is this anion gap on BMP. Other metabolic labs that we'd get uh, include plasma, plasma acylcarnitines, and we'd expect to see decreased free carnitine on our newborn screen and increased glutarocarnitine. And in the urine, we'd expect to see increased glutaric acid and 3-hydroxyglutaric acid, as I mentioned in the first slide. I'd just like to explain the uh, carnitine um, uh, findings just in a little more detail. So carnitine typically reacts with acyl-CoA um, to generate acetylcarnitine and CoA. And this is to allow the carnitine shuttle to transport fatty acids into the mitochondria. However, carnitine is also prone to react with other uh, molecules that are linked with CoA, such as glutarocoA. And what this can generate is glutarocarnitine instead of acetylcarnitine with CoA. So in the setting where we have increased glutarocoA because we have glutaric aciduria, what we end up getting is shunting uh, of this pathway towards the right. So we end up with increased glutarocarnitine and a depletion in free carnitine. And those are exactly the findings that we see here on our metabolic labs, a decrease in free carnitine and an increase in glutarocarnitine. And the diagnosis can be confirmed with genetic testing showing a biallelic mutation in this GCDH gene. So the management of this disease is primarily dietary. So patients would be instructed to eat a diet low in protein. This is particularly important early in life. Uh, the formula, special formula that they'd need would contain no lysine and would also be low in tryptophan. This is typically given until age six years. Um, that's because there's a lower chance of brain damage after this age. Um, and these restrictions can be relaxed after this age. So carnitine supplementation um, is also recommended, and this will repeat, replete some of the losses um, of carnitine due to the shunting and also due to urinary losses. Um, it also is thought to protect the brain or the cerebrum from damage from the glutaric acid. And as with all uh, organic acidemias, we want to avoid the fasting state. So routine surveillance for this disease would include quantitative plasma amino acids to quantify the amount of um, glutero-CoA and other amino acid metabolites that are present in the blood at any given time. Um, every time we see the patient, we want to screen the patient for movement disorder. So to do a complete neurologic exam, this is because of the devastating effects that we see on the brain in patients with this disease. And just as with any other child, we want to monitor developmental milestones and growth. This is particularly important for these patients as they may be predisposed to developmental delay. So as a case, um, let's say we have a 13-month-old girl with failure to thrive. She has some delayed motor and language skills. Her head circumference is above the 95th percentile and is noted to be enlarging. Um, the team gets a head MRI and this is what you see. Uh, so particularly notable are uh, two findings. So you have uh, what's called operculization of the sylvian fissures, which we see here. Uh, this is uh, classically known as the bat wing appearance on MRI. We can also see hyperdensity of the globus pallidus, again, which is part of the movement center of the brain here. And these are classic findings for patients with 
uh, this disorder. Another example that would present in a more acute setting would be an eight-month-old boy with fever for three days, a sweaty sock breath odor, and persistent altered mental status. This unique breath odor is particularly notable in patients who have uh, organic acidemias and disorders of uh, amino acid metabolism. So thanks for watching. If you found this video useful, please like this video and subscribe to this channel. You can also support more videos like this one by joining my Patreon. Thanks.